This program is brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U at Stanford University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu. It does give me great pleasure to share with you our experience here at Stanford um, using the CyberKnife radio surgery um, system. During this presentation, I'd like to review some of the early history um, of, of radiation therapy here at Stanford. And then I'd also like to review some of the definitions of radio surgery as I review the various types of radio surgery technology and our Stanford uh, uh, CyberKnife experience, talking, focusing then on our current and future uh, directions. By the end of the presentation, I hope to have shown you that Stanford continues to lead um, in medical innovation and that advances in uh, uh, radiation cancer therapies have paralleled advances in imaging and image guidance and that the Stanford Radio Surgery Program has led to new options for a variety of medical conditions, including cancer. Henry Kaplan was one of the early pioneers of radiation therapy here at Stanford. And I'm told by, pres uh, by patients, by residents, and, uh, and people who worked with him that patient care was definitely his main focus. And with the technologies of the time, there was some limitation in the way that radiation was de uh, delivered. He wanted to be able to deliver uh, radiation treatment to more deep-seated tumors instead of some of the superficial type of radiations that we were able to deliver at the time. And so he worked along with the um, individuals in the, uh, at the physics department, and that later uh, uh, became the first uh, linear medical linear accelerator used in the Western world. And here is a prototype of that device. And in 1955, that was installed, and by 1956, the first treatment in a young boy with uh, retinoblastoma uh, was completed here at Stanford. And Dr. Um, Kaplan also, um, uh, extending the issues of, of uh, collaboration, um, began in, to bring in members of other departments. And shown here, many of, many of you know, <laughs> Dr. Ro Rosenberg, who's still around, um, from medical oncology. And with their collaboration, some of the early treatment of Hodgkin's disease and some of the earliest cures of human cancers were seen. Later, um, Dr. Malcolm Bagshaw, who later chaired the Department of Radiation Oncology, extended some of the uh, use of radiation therapy. And it was under his tutelage that many of um, the current modern treatments of um, radiation therapy had their initial start. Um, he actually helped to define some of the first treatments of uh, external beam for prostate cancer, um, some of the techniques that we still use today and then extend it to, um, uh, to our newest technology. Also for head and neck cancer, one thing that Dr. Uh, Dr. Bagshaw emphasized was that we needed to know where we were treating and what the target was. And so here you see him with a fluoroscopy device um, setting up a patient for a daily treatment, um, exposing himself to a bit of um, radiation with the fluoroscopy device um, every day to set up a patient to make sure the patient was adequately treated each day. So the challenges of any radiation treatment device actually are uh, hopefully summarized in, um, in the following. One is to define the appropriate radiation targets and to define the appropriate radiation dose and compensating for organ motion. So here shown really is what our overall goal is, is to separate these two curves. Our tumor control curve, try to optimize that as much as possible and to limit toxicity to normal tissues uh, with um, the lowest dose um, possible to, uh, to avoid complications. Now for definitions of what radio surgery is. Uh, with modern imaging and the knowledge of uh, treatment failures, um, we, we're able to define what the appropriate targets um, for radiation therapy are. 
And so this has led, has led to more narrow fields of radiation and more narrow dose distributions around those target lesions. And champion among these highly conformal or narrow fields of radiation is radiosurgery. The hallmarks of radiosurgery are, one, it has to be very precise. The treatment beams are highly collimated in order to uh, produce this um, precision. They're usually small, discrete targets of small volume. The main hallmark of radiosurgery is the rapid dose fall off at the perimeter, perimeter of the target so that normal tissues outside of the target volume are not irradiated um, to high doses. One of the pioneers of radiosurgery, it was not from Stanford, but from Sweden, um, a gentleman known as um, Lars Luxell, he introduced some of the initial concepts of uh, stereotactic radiosurgery actually with proton beams. Now, proton beams are generated by a cyclotron, and these are not widely available across the world, but um, there was one uh, at the hospital that he was in, in Sweden, and he used cross-firing of beams of, of protons and a Cartesian coordinate system in order to direct the radiation um, beams, initially in animals and then later in, in human beings. And by 1968, a device known as the gamma knife uh, was introduced with um, using cobalt-60. Now, the gamma knife, again, it's, it's depicted here, one of the more current um, versions of this. There is a uh, place here for this helmet device to lodge in, but the patient is generally placed here, and the patient will have already had a rigid, rigidly fixed helmet device on his head, or actually frame device on his head, that's sort of bolted to the outer layer of the skull. And that ensures that the entire system doesn't move and that the precision and accuracy of the system uh, was maintained. So this is very precise and very, very accurate in delivering the treatment, but um, it was confined really to treatments in the head and neck areas because it's not really practical to immobilize with skeletal fixation other areas of the body because of discomfort. Because Gamma Knife essentially arrived on the scene worldwide as the first radiosurgical device, it has become sort of synonymous with radiosurgery. But the generic term is radiosurgery. Gamma Knife is one type of radiosurgery. The other types of radiosurgery involve radiosurgery that's delivered basically with the conventional linear accelerator, but the head of the device is uh, retrofitted to fit small collimat collimators, and so x-rays are used in that device. And all of these systems, with protons, with cobalt-60 or, or x-rays, um, rigid skeletal fixation is required in order to, um, to achieve the uh, degree of precision um, for radiosurgery targets. For the LINAC radiosurgery, linear accelerator radiosurgery, um, the head of the uh, radiation uh, linear accelerator device, this is called the gantry of the, of the machine, is retrofitted with a small collimator device, one of these very small cylindrical um, tubes. And um, in this radiosurgery plan, unlike the gamma knife system, which is static, this one is dynamic. Essentially, you put the collimator at the end of the machine, and it will rotate about various um, angles, creating an arc-like pattern around a given target. So if you have a complex target, and each of these represents a, a various arc, you can sort of paint dose around a complex target. And always the center is, is centered around the target, so that gets the main dose. And any tissues that are outside of uh, the target will only get a very, very minuscule amount of the radiation dose, while the target volume will always get the um, total dose. So in this way, you can deliver a dose that's conformal. That means it conforms to the shape of the, of the target, um, and that's very, very accurate. Now, one of the obvious limit limitations of these uh, other devices, as I mentioned, is the need for this stereotactic head frame. And this is a sort of funny picture that we've gotten from our archives here, where we've uh, kind of gained <laughs> very frustrated with the use of this stereotactic head frame. And you see John Adler when he had hair a little bit more. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and one of our um, dosimetries, dosimetrists here who's uh, showing you sort of how the patient must have felt with this head frame device. So certainly this was a limitation. And so it was, it was Dr. Adler, John Adler, who asked the question, can radio surgery be done without a head frame? And so he joined the faculty in the late 80s and uh, 
um, and by 1991 began to really tackle this question. And again, I'm talking about the legacy of um, innovation here at Stanford. He began to collaborate with um, individuals from the um, uh, School of Engineering and the Department of Robotics to answer this question. And what they came up, up with around 1991-ish was a way in which um, a patient would essentially stay still on the table, um, unlike the other devices where the, um, the couch sort of rotated um, and then the gantry rotated about them. Patient would be still here and they would be lightly immobilized, not with um, any rigid fixation or head device, um, and imaging images using an x-ray imager that gives low doses of radiation would be delivered um, to, and images cast onto uh, amplifiers. Um, we use amorphous silicon detectors and this would be quickly uh, relayed to a console that contains some previous imaging and those images would be overlaid and then the translations and rotations to achieve a perfect match would then be forwarded to the robot till the robot makes the move and delivers the treatment to where the patient really is instead of where you thought they should have been. And so um, all of this technology, all this, this um, formed the basis of what we know as a cyber knife. And here is when um, this uh, initial prototype device was delivered into Blake Wilbur building in which our first device um, was housed and our new devices are still housed. This is the very first version of that. And so as I mentioned, um, there's an image guidance system which uses these x-ray sources in the head of the machine on either side, which casts images on these amorphous silicon detectors. These amplify those images, and the images are then transformed back to a, a console and overlaid with um, previous images, um, digital reconstructions. And remember that linear accelerator I showed you earlier, the one with the gantry that rotated about the patient? It essentially took up about a half of a room. And so all of the components of that machine are now compacted into this device, which produces the x-rays. And this x-ray, this, this uh, linear accelerator, which is now able to fit in, the, fit in your hands, is mounted onto a complex robot that is able to perform those degrees of freedom to deliver the treatment accurately. So this involves very, very high-speed computers and high-speed robotics. And then the patient couch um, can move in and out and rotate in order to achieve some of the degrees of freedom that um, were, at that time were not um, achievable with, um, with the, um, just the robot itself. And so in a stepwise fashion, moving from, from angle to angle, the machine would deliver a, a dose of radiation, now no longer isocentric or uh, focusing just on the center of the tumor, but being able to deliver dose anywhere along the target and therefore giving a more even dose throughout the target. And so the simple fixation was just a, a aquaplast mask, which is not harmful and is not painful, and this replaced what w um, would have been um, a stereotactic frame. So most of our treatments um, in the early days were in the head and neck region, and this depicted here is a tumor near the base of skull, a fairly large tumor which if we were to have uh, treated this with the, a more conventional stereotactic radiosurgery um, would have been a bit scary because of the size of the lesion. With the elimination of the head frame device, we now are able to um, fractionate the treatment. That, that is to deliver the treatment over several days in order to achieve some additional degree of safety for um, the patient and the surrounding brain tissue. So here, a larger tumor, the green line representing the dose around the target that we want to achieve, and the red representing the target itself that we've outlined. And we, we see how that dose tightly conforms around the shape of that target just by delivering those sequential beams of radiation. And you may not be able to see it so clearly, but this represents about 80% or so of, uh, yeah, 71% of the maximum dose. And by this purple line, if you can see, it represents approximately 50%. So the dose falls off very, very quickly such that by the time you're about here, there's only negligible amounts of radiation dose that are delivered um, to that normal portion of brain tissue. 
and this is just shown in a um, sagittal and coronal projection and this also with the beam, with uh, each of the beams um, from which directions they come from but throughout the treatment it's always precisely delivered to where the patient is so unlike some radiosurgery devices which may set the patient up initially confirm that they're in the right position and then you walk away you deliver the treatment and if the patient has moved a bit between those treatments, then you may be um, uh, experiencing what we call a geometric miss of the radiation dose. Here, you're tracking throughout the treatment to always target the radiation precisely where it needs to be um, at all times. And also, this has also revolutionized the way that we treat tumors in the pituitary region. Tumors of the pituitary region are very, very close to this structure called the optic chiasm and optic nerves, and this is what gives you sight. And so if these tumors are treated with radiosurgery and the, and the um, nerve is also treated to the high dose of radiosurgery, um, blindness may um, in incur. But with this tight dose of radiation, we're able to deliver to this green line the target dose to the tumor. And even though the chiasm is very, very close to the, uh, the tumor, we're able to have dose fall off quickly enough so that this is only 50% of the dose um, delivered to the um, chiasm. And by the time you get to the middle of the chiasm, the dose is very, very low. So we generally would fractionate this over several days to add an, an additional um, bit of safety. And so these tumors that once used to be treated by external beam of radiation, treating a field that encompassed the temporal lobes of the brain and other areas of the brain with wide fields of radiation is now no longer necessary. Here's another picture of a head and neck tumor, a nasopharynx tumor, uh, which we uh, routinely now boost with radiosurgery um, in order to achieve local control. And my colleague, Dr. Quinn Lee, has um, published that uh, with boosting these tumors with radiosurgery, we've improved local control. So a brief history again is in 1994, as I mentioned, the CyberKnife was introduced. Um, the first spine treatment was um, done in 1995. In the early days, as I mentioned, the, the issues of being able to deliver the, um, the treatment to a, to a patient in order to fo um, and following the patient movement on the table was achievable. Still, organ motion was still an issue that still needed to be refined. The spine does not move um, much with respiration, um, and neither does the brain, and so the, um, those treatments were um, fairly simply um, um, treated at, that, at those times. By 1997, we began to explore um, various tumors that, um, that do move with respiration um, more, and, that's, and we started with the, the pancreas, and we began to, we opened a protocol for pancreatic tumors. And in these tumors, what we did is we um, introduced fiducial markers, which are small um, radio opaque markers within the tumor under CT guidance, and then used those markers to follow um, throughout treatment. Um, because we didn't have a dynamic um, tracking system at that time, we had the patients um, do what we call a breath hold technique, where during that period of breath holding, we did the imaging, we did the registration of the images, and the treatment delivery. And that was in a repetitive process. So each of these treatments took um, the order of three to four hours, and sometimes even more, to deliver. So in the early days, um, we were able to achieve that um, accuracy, but again, with the expense of time. And so as time went on, we began to open this up to treat lung tumors. By 2001, the FDA um, granted approval of the device, and this um, approval extended to all areas in the body where radiation was indicated. And this was largely based on our experience here at Stanford and four other institutions who also had the CyberKnife um, uh, early technology at that time. And since that time, we've uh, begun to treat many other um, lesions. Um, we have began late last year treating prostate cancer, and that is, remains an active program. And uh, this year, we opened a uh, program to treat liver tumors. So the modern-day CyberKnife looks like this. It has a now fancy new cover, but essentially the same um, issues are at play. In addition to um, the image guidance system that we talked about before, we now have gained um, the use of the synchrony respiratory tracking system, and I'll show you 
uh, what that entails. So in the early days, mainly targets that didn't move too much. Now we're actively pursuing the treatment of, of lesions that, that move with respiration because uh, we can create an algorithm between external wall motion and those internal fiducials that I talked to you about. And we can keep um, updating that throughout the treatment cycle. And so the patients can just breathe freely instead of having to hold his breath throughout the treatment. So the treatment times have been reduced substantially. And this is a short video of what the synchrony respiratory tracking system looks like. Um, this is the machine. And if you can watch closely, you'll see this is a lung tumor. Um, you can see that these LEDs, light emitting diodes placed on the patient, interact with a um, detector that's in the head of the, so as the patient is breathing, this is detecting the external movement while the images detect the internal motion. And as you can look, you can see this moving up and down with the breathing. So in a real dynamic way, <laughs> sorry, it's very, ever so slight, but the head of the device is, moves um, along with the breathing. But the important thing about this is that not only are we monitoring external um, movement, also um, internal movement by those fiducials that are placed within the tumor. So the relationship between the internal fiducials and the external markers is constantly being updated so that you're always accurately targeting the tumor at all times. And this is an example of some of the small gold seeds that are placed using CT um, guidance uh, in the tumor. And this is what they look like on, on x-ray, a lung tumor with uh, a few fiducials in and around the area of the tumor and one of the early prototypes of that synchrony uh, device. Here showing the relationship between the position of the fiducials and the external markers and making sure that that relationship is updated in real time. So certainly with the advent of high-speed computers, we've been able to um, achieve this. And here's a picture of a pancreatic tumor with the fiducial markers near it. I should have slowed down the CT, but this is a CT scan with again the uh, pancreatic tumor. And this just shows how we're able to really tightly conform the dose of radiation around and with, with great confidence around um, targets that move. And um, with uh, more conformal radiation techniques, you would have delivered a radiation portal that would have treated all of this. So bowel, kidneys that are behind, some of the liver, um, in order to achieve dose here because the pa with the patient movement, you have to cover any area where the tumor could have been during that time of treatment. So in order to compensate for that in the past, we've always treated fairly large radiation fields. But now with confidence, we can deliver radiation more tightly around um, targets. And this is just a video of how these fiducial markers move. And so you can see that, at least internally, the the tumor itself probably is moving more up, to, up and down rather than side to side. And that's why it, it, it's very important to not only um, track the external movement, which some devices that are currently in use, um, such as uh, Novalis, um, use really just that external motion after initially setting the patient up for the internal fiducials, no longer using that information and just using the external motion. It's very important because sometimes that relationship changes. In the, Last 10 years, essentially, of the CyberKnife radio surgery program, this is what our treatment volumes have been. At this point, we've treated over 1,700 um, lesions in approximately 1,500 patients. In the early years, um, I think because of a lot of the conservative use of the machine and trying to make sure that we define um, all of the bugs in the system and defining ways um, um, to accurately uh, deliver the treatment, only a few patients, less than 100 patients, were treated uh, before 2000. By 2000, we were able to uh, uh, treat over 150 patients. And since that time, the, our volume has continuously increased. Now, that increase has um, been much more substantial at the F after the FDA approval, um, but um, we continue to grow. Still, we treat mainly tumors of the brain and the head and neck. Um, since that's where most of the indications for radiosurgery have been historically. 
And most of those are patients with metastases um, that go to the brain. Brain metastases is a very common um, uh, phenomenon during, during the uh, lifetime of a patient who develops uh, cancer. Um, probably at least uh, 20 or 30 percent of patients will um, develop um, brain metastases at some point, given de depending on the type of tumor. And then we're, we also treat quite a few benign tumors, such as acoustic neuroma, which is a specific kind of, of, of tumor that leads to eventual hearing loss if left untreated. And so we've been able to show that we can preserve hearing in that group of patients. We've been able to treat patients with meningiomas, another benign type of tumor, pituitary tumors, and uh, arterial venous malformations. We treat a substantial number of patients with a pain disorder called trigeminal neuralgia. And uh, this is a very painful phenomenon where the nerve is, is um, essentially irritated and we give a very ablative dose very, very precisely to a small segment of a very fine nerve and um, achieve pain relief in those patients. Um, in terms of fractionation, again, I mentioned to you that CyberKnife allows us to be able to fractionate the dose of this very precise um, treatment in order to add an, an additional degree of, of coverage and um, of protection to the normal tissues. Um, most of our patients still are treated in one treatment, um, but I think overall, approximately, our average fraction size now is probably about two to two and a half fractions. So a number of patients are treated by three fractions, um, but most are still treated with uh, a single um, treatment. In the years since 1999, we've seen a steady growth in our non-brain or non-CNS tumors. And I think this year we will have seen that approximately one-third of our patients have been treated for tumors that are outside of the head and neck region. Um, and so that's a remarkable accomplishment given the initial goals um, set forth of this, this um, technology. So I think that we're on the horizon of a, a new era where stereotactic radio surgery is now being used much more confidently for those moving targets, what we call extracranial radio surgery outside of the brain or outside of the skull. So this represents our volume in uh, treatment of patients from 1995 to 2004 with, for extracranial radio surgery. Our, uh, the highest increase is, was experienced for spine tumors and for tumors that, um, of the pancreas region. Uh, one of my colleagues is, uh, has completed one and um, has embarked upon um, an, a, another uh, protocol, uh, phase um, one, phase two protocol in pancreatic cancer and was able to show that um, the quality of life is maintained and the treatment is delivered in a single fraction instead of over six weeks. And so the same degree of palliation that is achievable with a six-week course of radiation is achievable with a single treatment here. So I think this may, for this particular disease, may not prove to be a curative role, but may impact the overall um, quality of life and palliation for that group of patients. In other areas, as you can see, our prostate volume has increased substantially over this last year and uh, will continue to grow. This represents um, a treatment of a spine lesion. This is one of the very early treatments of a spine lesion that we use. This is called an arterial venous malformation. And these will bleed spontaneously. And up until the advent of a CyberKnife device, this would have been left untreated with the natural history leading to essentially um, bleeding and paralysis in, the, in this um, patient. And so in the early days, we um, embarked upon treating this lesion, which encompasses a fair segment of the spinal cord, and treated that um, over three um, sessions. Um, and this shows the initial arterial venous malformation. And after the treatment, this had reduced substantially. And at this point, two years later, we then retreated this area. And the patient still remains stable neurologically without paralysis. And um, we're awaiting. Um, a follow-up angiogram, which we usually do about three or four years afterwards, um, to, to confirm that the nidus is um, obliterated. And vertebral metastases is a very common problem among patients who develop cancer. Um, and so most of the times they start in the um, body of the spinal vertebral vertebra, um, and um, the tumor um, will generally grow to the point that it's pressing on the spinal cord itself. Here, the spinal cord is outlined in green, and we've been able to deliver a radiation dose that conforms around the um, target lesion 
and avoids uh, to a large degree the spinal cord itself. This is in a patient who had previously received uh, wide fields of external beam irradiation. And so the doses that we could safely deliver to the um, spinal cord again after this tumor recurred was very, very um, low. So we had to um, compromise a little bit of the coverage of the tumor here in order to achieve this dose distribution around the spinal cord, 30% of the maximum dose within less than a few millimeters of the actual target lesion. And here's an example of our modern day treatment of, of, pink, of prostate cancer. Um, this shows one of our newer techniques and um, external radiation intensity modulated radiotherapy versus what we can achieve with CyberKnife. So uh, comparatively, this is a very um, update, up-to-date um, treatment technique. And so is the CyberKnife. Here we see the prostate gland outlined in red here, and again also shaded in red here. And the target dose of radiation is shown here in white, and it conforms to the dose of the, um, uh, the shape of the prostate. And just behind the prostate is the rectum, and the rectum is usually the site in which many of the side effects of prostate treatment um, uh, can uh, result from. And so bleeding, diarrhea, um, and so we try to, to limit the dose as much as possible. And here we're able to tighten that dose so that, um, that the, radi the high dose radiation is limited to a very small area. And here with the IMRT plan, we're able to do something similar, but um, probably to a slightly better degree here with the CyberKnife um, treatment. So very good technologies, both are trying to achieve that, that uh, avoidance of these normal structures. And here shown is a liver tumor that we're able to treat in a similar fashion. We've also been able to combine these treatments with um, uh, advances in um, radiobiology and combine them with, um, with radio enhancers. And I've recently opened a clinical trial exploring the use of a novel uh, radi radiation enhancer, arsenic trioxide, for malignant brain tumors. These tumors are very, very hard to treat and will inevitably come back. And so we've opened a trial for the tumors that have come back um, and treated them with a conformal dose of the radio surgery along with the uh, radio enhancing agent to help the radiation work um, better. And so here we see in a recurrent setting um, a tumor that's treated to this green line and we're able to limit the dose to this rest of the brain which has already received a, a large uh, amount of radiation and in, in one month um, part of the tumor has, um, has responded to the treatment. And so we're encouraged about the study and we're continuing to accrue um, patients. And so it's been tolerated quite well. In terms of our contributions to the medical literature, we've shown feasibility in, in the spine and, and those um, studies are published and additional studies will be published soon. Um, accuracy studies that confirm the overall accuracy of the um, radio surgery device. Um, lung feasibility um, studies have been um, have been uh, published. A phase one trial, as I mentioned earlier, in locally advanced pancreas cancer showing the positive effects in terms of palliation. Um, nasopharynx um, studies that have shown local control in um, nasopharynx cancer. The feasibility of treating perioptic lesions like the one I showed you earlier, it's very uh, pituitary tumor that's very close to the optic nerve. Um, we've um, published that recently. And um, the successful management of trigeminal neuralgia, that pain syndrome, um, and glomus tumor, other um, tumors of the head and neck. And we've also shown that um, this is safe and reliable treatment that preserves hearing in patients with acoustic neuroma. And so our future directions are to expand our treatments of uh, tumors such as the prostate and liver. Um, we're exploring the idea of maybe having a second cyber knife because right now we've, uh, we're treating maybe up to 500 patients this year um, and to build programs in breast cancer and pediatric tumors and to expand um, combining the, the cyber knife technology with radio enhancing agents and um, biologic target agents. I hope I've been able to show you that um, Stanford continues to lead the way in medical innovation and that the cyber knife technology has led to um, increased options for many patients uh, with um, a variety of human cancers. I just wanted to thank everyone for this, this effort and I appreciate your um, listening. Thank you.
So the question is whether or not there are any side effects to the treatment of, the, of prostate cancer. Um, the gentleman has explored the potential use of, uh, of a cyber knife um, and wants to know whether or not there are side effects. With all of the technologies, there are oftentimes mild side effects, and I think what Dr. King has shown is that there's still some, some uh, mild diarrhea, um, but what we look, uh, but the um, early side effects um, for this are fairly mild. Um, we need to follow patients out longer to make sure there isn't any um, fistula development, any um, uh, scarring um, to the um, rectum um, with this technique. The question is, is um, what can we expect from the side effects of a treatment, a single treatment for a um, brain tumor that will be treated um, with the CyberDive tomorrow? Um, what we can expect is that he'll come in and he'll probably feel fine. He'll uh, lie on the table and will be fitted with the uh, mask and will probably go to sleep on the table. And the radiation machine will rotate about him probably for about um, 30 to 45 minutes. And um, he may give a, get a dose of a steroid medication depending on how large the tumor is. Uh, once that's done, um, he'll generally get back off the table and go home and feel fine. So most of the patients, particularly with the brain tumors, very simple treatment that, um, that doesn't usually lead to any immediate side effects. The question is, now that we're able to do fractionated treatment, now, now how have we changed our um, treatment of, in terms of the size of the lesions that we can treat? In the past, when it was only one um, radiation shot that we could use, we often limited the size to about three centimeters. Um, and while we haven't expanded it much more than that, maybe even up to about four or five centimeters, um, we try to take into account how much low-dose radiation the rest of the brain will get. And the larger the volume that's treated by the, um, the focus radiation, the larger the volume of that low-dose radiation to normal tissues. For tumors outside of the brain, it's a little bit more forgiving. Um, where, as you saw, we were treating a a uh, prostate that may be around 60 or 70 cubic centimeters in size, and because of the normal structures being um, being the rectum and not so much um, uh, the small bowel, we're able to avoid quite a bit of, of toxicity just because there aren't a lot of other real um, uh, real um, dangerous structures um, immediately close by, and so we're able to treat larger area larger tumors in those areas. So the question is, what is the reasonable number of tumors we can treat with the CyberKnife? I'm not sure that I mentioned earlier about the number of tumors, but um, usually we're faced with that problem with patients who present with um, metastases, particularly in the brain, where, they're, where they can be multiple. And there we kind of use our judgment because um, sometimes if there are multiple, more than four or five tumors, that may be a, a harbinger of other microscopic areas that may be um, present. So maybe a full course of whole brain irradiation may still be indicated um, because with the radiosurgery technology, you're really only treating what you see and what you can detect at that time. And so uh, we generally will take it case by case and sort of determine whether or not um, we can get away with treating just the tumors that we see um, and then sort of wait to see if others will develop later or not develop later. So it depends on the site. Um, in the liver, we try to limit the um, number of tumors to about three areas, um, not encompassing more than a quarter of the, the total liver with the, radio, um, with the um, radiation plan. The question is, are there any other differences between the um, CyberKnife and the intensity modulated radiotherapy? And I'd like to clarify that on that slide, um, it's um, IMRT, or intensity modulated radiotherapy, is a very, very precise way of delivering radiation. It is one of our most, it, it, um, one of our uh, biggest advancements in um, external beam irradiation, um, along with the CyberKnife technology. Um, so the differences are, are sometimes subtle. So on that slide, there's only a small area where the IMRT plan gives a little bit more of the rectal wall than the um, cyber knife. So in a practical sense, probably each of those would probably be very, very um, good technologies. I think what the um, cyber knife um, offers is being able to treat in a, um, a fewer number of treatments. You could potentially treat with IMRT in a fewer number of treatments, but with that technology, the precision 
in terms of daily delivery is still not as good as that with, um, with the cyber knife. So you would not want to give all of the dose and only a few treatments because um, the safety factor in terms of um, normal tissues and how the organ will move from day to day um, compared to that original treatment plan that you would have delivered. What is our um, current throughput, given that we can treat um, four courses of radiation and usually one or a few treatments? And then how does the access, I mean, what's the access to the, radi to the cyber knife technology to our patients? Okay, to answer the first question, our throughput is such that we probably treat about 10 to 12 patients up to about um, 20, maybe 20 lesions um, a week, depending on how we fractionate. So. 10 to 12 patients. Um, each of these treatments still is much longer than it generally uh, is for um, a standard external beam treatment. Though some of the IMRT treatments can be fairly long because they usually may have 12 fields, but in any case, um, this ends up being a little bit longer. And so our throughput is limited by still the length of the treatment, but most of the times the patients are very happy in that they're able to get their treatment done in one session rather than over six or seven weeks. Um, in terms of the access, as I mentioned, it's FDA approved device. And so until we begin to define, we as clinicians define its use uh, uh, appropriately for various tumors, um, that's gonna define the access to, um, uh, to the patients. I know that, um, at least for brain tumors, it's, it's um, definitely considered a standard treatment that insurance companies will recognize for spinal tumors and for other indications where um, more conventional radiation definitely is, does not play a role, there's no real um, um, problem in terms of insurance. Where there may be um, an issue is where the insurance may have a, I don't know, a vested interest in um, the sort of six-week course of radiation, which in some cases may be um, less expensive um, than the cyber knife treatment over a few a number of treatments. And so that is uh, a murky ground right now that will uh, need to be uh, determined as we, we get um, the clinical studies completed to determine whether or not there is, in fact, an advantage um, of this technology over the others. So the question is, what is the survival rate among the approximately 1,500 patients that we've treated to date? Um, this is a v v um, varied group of patients. So these are patients largely actually with benign tumors um, or benign conditions, uh, many of whom also have um, um, malignant tumors. And it also depends, so it depends on what type of tumor the patient may have had and um, what stage in the illness that they presented to us with. So that's a very difficult question to answer right now. The question is, is whether or not this could be used in someone who may have um, already been exposed to their lifetime maximum, what we think of um, uh, for certain tumors, and specifically um, a superficial tumor who may have developed more a more um, uh, internal tumor. I think it could very well be used in that setting. Um, certainly, I think um, treatment to uh, tumors that are very superficial, like on the skin, this would not be the best uh, technology to use for that. But for more deep-seated tum tumors, um, this may very well be um, an option. So the question is um, how the seed implant for prostate cancer compares um, with the cyber knife technology for prostate cancer. And right now, our, our studies are still fairly early. Um, I think Dr. King, he can talk with you uh, in a lot more detail, but he um, is one, one of the pioneers who has developed the concept that maybe prostate cancer responds a little bit better to giving more doses in a, single, in a couple of fractions instead of over a long weeks. Um, and, uh, and so if you compare that to the low dose rate um, that is achieved by um, the seed implant, uh, perhaps in theory, um, these uh, more hypofractionated techniques like CyberKnife may very well um, lead to more durable cures, but we won't know that for a long time. So the question is, how do we find out um, where a patient in London might um, get information about a CyberKnife that may be near or even come um, to the United States to, to get treatment? I'll tell you that the um, I don't work for Accuray, but um, uh, I do, I am uh, privy to a, a lot of the information since I, I uh, that's the company that makes the CyberKnife now, um, to some of the information with regard to 
um, new sites that are developing. And throughout Europe, um, particularly during this next year, I think several sites are, are, will be opening. There is a site in, there are two sites in Italy at this point, I think almost three. Um, I just presented at a uh, conference in Amsterdam, so I know there's one um, in um, Rotterdam that's just about to open up. Whether or not they would be initially um, beginning programs to treat trigeminal neuralgia is another story. Um, but um, there are sites throughout Europe that are, are developing. I, I would say at this point, probably the sites in Italy um, in Europe are, are the ones that are probably more poised at this point in treating that condition. But this patient can always contact us here through our um, website here, and we, we see patients um, all across the world. So worldwide, what is the most common tumor that's treated with the cyber knife? I would still say at this point it's going to be um, brain metastases. And um, from uh, there, probably some other benign tumors like meningioma. Acoustic neuroma is a not so common tumor, but we see quite a bit here because we have our cyber knife program up. Um, and so probably the meningiomas in the benign category would be the next uh, most common. So the question I think is, how does the, how does the cyber knife treat a pancreatic tumor? All right. So how does a, um, the cyber knife? The, the seeds that are placed in and around the tumor are simply used just to track the motion from the inside. From the outside, there's an external markers that are used to track. The radiation beam is delivered in a sequential fashion so that a small part is sort of zapped at one point with the radiation. It does not burn the tumor, but um, on a DNA level, it affects the DNA. So it takes time for the tumor to respond. So if you get a scan the next day, it's probably going to look exactly the same as it does the day of the treatment. But over time, if the treatment has been effective, those tumor cells will begin to die on their own and to die based on that damage to the DNA that the um, radiation had delivered the time before. And another point is that in the treatment of uh, malignant disease like pancreatic cancer, there are two things that are important. One is control of the tumor right where you treat it. So that's what we call local control. And then the other part is to control the tumor. You know, there's a sort of internal mechanism of the tumor that can microscopically spread through blood vessels or through lymphatics to other organs. And so that's called overall control or metastatic control. And for pancreatic tumors, what Dr. Kuhn was able to show was that we, with the cyber knife, was, we were able to deliver very good local control. But many of these tumors still spread elsewhere. Whether or not that happened before we even did the treatment or at some time early in the disease um, or sometime later is unclear. Um, and so that's the part of the disease that we've um, been less successful. And that's why we haven't been able to really cure many of those patients. Not because of the local disease, we've been able to control that, but um, to control it more distantly. How much does positive attitude have to do with treatment? I am not able to quantitate that, but I generally feel that patients who are more positive about their treatment generally um, do better. The question is whether or not we um, are treating non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with this technology at this point. At this point, we are not um, treating non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as a general rule, um, uh, mainly because um, with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, depending on which grade it is. Um, it may be a very indolent tumor, uh, which may not need any treatment at all in some cases. And in other cases, um, because of the diffuse nature of where the lymph nodes are spread out, this may be too targeted for that kind of treatment. So right now, we've, we've, not, been able, um, we've not been using this for that. The question is whether or not we've treated other bones um, other than the spine, and the answer is yes. We've treated other bones um, instead of the spine. And then um, the other question is whether or not the um, response is um, uh, essentially dictated by um, the histologies of the tumor. And I think the response um, for malignant tumors is often um, dictated by, um, by the histology. And you said specifically adenocystic tumors. Um, and um, just in the handful of adenocystic tumors that we've treated, I would say it's still a very tough one to control.
The preceding program was brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U and is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu.